what Klaus said, that these various climate engineering approaches introduce, while they might reduce risk in some ways, introduce new elements of risk, whereas I don't see the kind of thing that Klaus Lackner is working on, removing CO2 from the atmosphere, as introducing new elements of risk in the same way that climate engineering does. So personally, I don't even consider what Klaus does to be in the realm of climate engineering. I think that carbons, it's basically removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere should be uncontroversial, whereas I think well-informed, intelligent people can differ on the wisdom of focusing on direct climate manipulation. Perhaps I can start with Professor Lackner and ask you, Professor, if there is a national geoengineering research program established in the States. Well, there has not been. You asked me whether it should be? Yes. I would, again, treat it with caution. I would view this as the backstop. We need to consider what happens if climate change runs away much faster than we thought. But I think it's very important also in the public discourse to make clear that it by itself does not solve the problem and only allows you to tie over until you really solve the problem in a direct manner, maybe dealing with carbon dioxide. Thank you very much. And I'm going to ask the same question of the people in the room here. Do you think a national geoengineering program should be established and how should it be structured, if you agree? Yes, you should certainly have it. I think you could probably build it onto the existing research councils with perhaps some ring-fenced money that the government decides on the amount of. Is that agreed by our other two guests or do you have different views? I'm basically in agreement. I think that as Dan Lunt is an example of a scientist who's working primarily on other sorts of climate change problems but focused some of his energy on climate engineering. And I think that is a good model that I don't think we need to create a cadre of climate engineers. I think we need climate scientists and good engineers who can then apply their skills to this problem also. But I don't think we're really looking to develop a people who have vested interest in specific outcomes. Do you agree with those views or do you have a different view? Yes, I would agree with those views. I think the focus has to be on science to improve mitigation and obviously adaptation to unavoidable climate change. And many of the techniques that are available from looking at the impacts of mitigation can also be looked at and used to look at geoengineering as well. Is this kind of research better done in a university environment or should you have a kind of hub mentality where it's all concentrated in one place and little bits spew out now and again? It may be different in both countries because the university environment in Britain is kind of like that at the minute in terms of its funding. What do you think in the States and or in this country could be best for them? I admit a vested interest since I am located at Stanford and have a position at Stanford as well. But I am a big advocate of university competitive funding. I also think that the big research centers like NCAR and Hadley Center have made incredibly valuable contributions. And so I think, and on the engineering side is really, so on the climate science side, I think there are existing institutions and it's a matter of increasing the scope of the research and the funding. On the engineering side, it's very different because there's nobody actually trying to build 
deployment systems today, and this uh, might need to be treated in a different way. So you would support, from your experience, Tyndall centers and Hadley centers doing this kind of work? Yes. In a competitive way? I think I'm a big fan of the competitive peer, peer review process. I think all of this uh, research should be in the open literature. There should be nothing classified or closed, and I would like to see it as, an, as open and a competitive process as Professor possible. Professor what do you think of that and Dr. Paul? Um, I've had a, a great deal of help from the uh, National Center for Atmospheric Research in Boulder, Colorado, uh, with suggestions and numbers for the work I've been doing. So I, I think you can mix big laboratories and universities. Uh, I think universities are, probably have uh, a more rapid response and can come up with uh, ideas a bit more flexibly than the laboratory where people are told what to do. I feel, and maybe I haven't got any evidence here, that places like the Hadley Centre would be uh, more effective if the people, the individuals there, could have a fraction of their time, say 25%, to do exactly what they wanted to do rather than being told what the government <coughs> department wants. Um, and well, there's you, a you can tell me that you do yeah. have this freedom. I'm sure you agree with that. Yeah. <laughs> um, maybe I should just introduce the Hadley Centre a little bit and my, my role. I'm the Head of Climate Change Advice at the Met Office Hadley Centre. I'm sure you all know that the Met Office provides the weather forecasts every day, but of course um, it also hosts the institution that provides underpinning climate science um, to, provide, to underpin government policy. So we're commissioned in the Hadley Centre by uh, DEC now, formerly DEFRA, and MOD um, to provide independent climate research um, to underpin policy. And of course, part of that work, a very large part of that work, is to develop um, one of the world's leading climate models. Um, and these climate models, as, as was mentioned earlier, are, are now getting into the Earth system realm so that they can represent both biological, chemical processes, as well as the main climate processes in the atmosphere and the ocean and the land surface. And so we, are, we do actually have the tools available to look at many of these, these sorts of issues. Um, my role uh, is actually to provide the interface between the science and the policy makers. So I'm the person that tells the scientists what to do, but believe me, they are scientists and they do what they want as well. So um, they, are, um, you know, they, they will challenge that and say these are the important issues and come back, in fact, to the government departments and say, well, shouldn't we be looking at this? Um, so it is very much a two-way process, and I'm very much in the middle of that. Um, and so if we believe that something is important for climate change, we will look at it. I just really wanted to give a couple of examples of two recent studies that, that um, haven't been published yet. One's been accepted for publication, another one has just been submitted, that um, look at some of the issues involved. And, and one study um, showed that if you take short-term interventions, so the sort of direct climate engineering that people were talking about, that perhaps that act in the short term, they could actually mask climate change. And when those interventions stop, you will actually end up with higher levels of climate change than you had before. Um, and so really you need to look very carefully at those things. Um, another example is, is if you make changes to the climate um, on a regional scale, they could have adverse effects in other regions of the globe. The climate system is very interlinked, so changes in one place affect other places. And it's only really by running climate models that we can assess those impacts. And even if you switch the engineering off, actually the impact could be irreversible, so you could have a, a long-term detrimental effect that you perhaps hadn't anticipated. But, uh, we believe that one of the things that your organisation has been looking at is uh, uh, the consequences of cloud albedo enhancement. Yes. Could you just tell us uh, what that is, how you've been going about it? Is it modelling or real experiments? And uh, what are the main lessons of that research, please? Well, we took um, the proposal that uh, Professor Salter came up with to um, alter the properties of the, of the clouds. Um, and, and essentially, we didn't look at any of the engineering issues. We just assumed that it would work and make a large impact on the stratocumulus <coughs> clouds. So these are clouds off the coasts of Africa and uh, South America. And it looked at what the consequences of that would be for the climate as a whole. And what we found was if you change the clouds sufficiently to have an impact on climate to actually reduce the warming, that will also have consequences right the way around, particularly the tropics. So it could change the El Nino, for example, which is very important for climate variability. It could um, enhance the destruction of the rainforest. So we already know that climate change is likely to, to um, actually uh, cause dieback of the rainforest, and it could make that worse. If you then switch that, um, that engineering off, if you, you stop producing the aerosol, you stop brightening the clouds, 
um, the, um, the cooling goes away and you'd get enhanced warming, but the, the changes in the rainforest could actually be permanent or effectively permanent because it takes many thousands of years for it to recover. But is this virtual yeah. work or actual it's work? It's virtual world, yes, it has yeah. to be virtual. So really what we're looking at is not a prediction of the future, 